touch eyes. Let's praise Jesus this morning. Come on, y'all. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah. Who shakes the whole?
says, I will exalt you, my God the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. 
They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell of your power, of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyfully sing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does.
wanted to make some space for the Holy Spirit. We did this in first service, and so we're just going to let, we're just going to take a moment of quiet and listen, because I believe that the Lord has something for each and every one of us. Lord, we want to hear you speak, Lord. We make room for you. Father in heaven, we thank you for this time that we get to come together as a church, as your body, and lift up your name together. What a beautiful thing that it is to worship you. Lord, we pray that our hearts will put a smile on your face. And Jesus, we thank you for who you are and all that you've done, how you humbled yourself as a servant how you came to the earth as fully God and fully man and that you paid the ultimate price so that we could be free in you. Thank you that you died willingly for us, that you love each and every one of us no matter what we've done, no matter where we've been, no matter what we've thought, that there is new life in you. Lord, we thank you that you are moving in our midst. We want to abide in you. Lord, we pray that in this house, there would be your freedom here. Give us expectant hearts. May we not leave here the same, Lord. Please speak through our pastor and may the word dwell in our hearts today, God. You are so good. You are so worthy, mighty, holy, and great. We give you all the praise and all the worship today. It's all about you, Jesus. More of you and less of us. In the wonderful, beautiful name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen, church. He is so good. Now at this time, we're going to get cozy, say hi to someone, shake a hand, give a hug, make three new friends. <laughs> and if you're tuning in online, let us know where you're tuning in from because you are family too. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, City Church. My name is Karen Dees, and I am so grateful that I have found this place that I can call home. I wanna welcome each and every one of you to church today. If you're with us online, we're so glad that you're tuning in. I wanna personally invite you to join us in person at nine o'clock or 11 o'clock a.m. We cannot wait to meet you. Make sure you stay connected with us on all of our socials so you can keep up to date with all the things that are going on here at City Church. You can find us on Spotify, Instagram, YouTube, and Facebook. If you're new here, we are so glad that you're with us today. Make sure you stop by the Connection Center. Before you leave today, we have a gift for you. We hope you enjoy the service and keep coming back. Easter service is next week, y'all. This is a great opportunity to invite a neighbor or a coworker or a friend with you to church so that they can hear the good news about Jesus. Because we wanna make sure that we have room for everybody, we're gonna be having three services that morning here at the summit. 
one at 8.30, one at 10 o'clock, and one at 11.30. Now we know that 8.30 is a little early for some of us, so um, as a bonus for all you early risers, we'll be having Jack's Donuts before the 8.30 service only. These aren't any donuts, they're Jack's Donuts, so I know for me personally, say less, I'm there. You won't be able to get one after service, so make sure you get here early before the 8.30 service to grab your coffee and your donuts before service starts. Again, those service times for Easter Sunday are 8.30, 10 o'clock, and 11.30. We are so grateful for the generosity of this church. Know that the Lord is using your financial gifts to make a great impact for His kingdom. If you would like to give, there are two ways you can do so. You can go to ForTheCity.com and click the Give button, or you can give by cash or check in the box at the back of the auditorium. However you give, just know that we are grateful for your generous heart. Well, that is all the announcements that I have for us today. Please join me in welcoming Pastor Chris to the stage as he continues his series, Encounters with Jesus. Hey, good morning, church, and uh, so good to have each and every one of you with us today. I am so excited for Easter Sunday as well. Uh, man, it's going to be a great day, and so I want to just encourage you, you can attend any one of those services, the 8.30, the 10, or the 11.30, and um, want to also remind you to be thinking about, praying about, and then extending that invite to somebody who, who doesn't have a church home this week. Uh, the reality is people who don't go to church will go to church on Easter Sunday, and so this is an incredible opportunity for us to, to invite them in and, and to to enable them to hear the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Um, and so I'm so excited about that. And, uh, and just want to remind you, those services will be one hour in length. So that way we'll be able to um, uh, turn over our parking lot and get people in and out of the building okay. We are expecting a full house uh, on that day, but, but we're shrinking our service time. I know normally we're a little longer than an hour, but, uh, but on Easter Sunday, we're going to keep that to one hour in length. So even if you normally come to the 11 o'clock, if you show up at the 1130 next week, we'll still wrap up by 1230, which is normally when you're getting out of here anyway. So just want to give you a heads up if you're trying to plan. I know there are lots of details around Easter Sunday with family and those sorts of things. So I wanted you to be prepared for that. And then also want to remind you that we are four weeks away from our grand opening of our permanent location. That's right. So four weeks from today. Uh, we are now less than a month away, and I am so excited about this. We were there yesterday uh, with some volunteers, and I just want to say those of you who've had the opportunity to step in and volunteer in any way to help uh, see this project through, again, thank you so much. And for those of you who are giving and, and um, have made pledges and fulfilling those pledges and giving to our future location, thank you as well. Uh, man, it is, it is so exciting. It's coming together so well, and, and we'll share a little bit more uh, in detail about that next Sunday. So make sure you're here on Easter so you can see a little update on our project as well, but we were there yesterday. We were testing out uh, chairs because I, I didn't believe we could get as many chairs in there as they were telling us they think we can. And so we had to actually uh, kind of arrange them in sections and figure out how many we're going to get in there. And, and, and we're pretty confident we're going to be able to fit uh, 900 chairs in our new auditorium space, which praise God, uh, it's about double what we can do in this space. Uh, and so we are making room for more people to hear the good news uh, about Jesus. And so I want to encourage you to be thinking and praying about who you're going to invite to our grand opening as well. Uh, as I talk to people in our community. There are so many people who are just curious because they shopped there or they worked there at some point when it was a grocery store and they just want to see what we've done to the place. And so um, I, I want to encourage you, even if that's your, your gateway to get somebody to come check it out, it is okay. Uh, whatever it takes to get somebody to come and, and hear about Jesus, we're, we're good with that. All right. So be praying about that and inviting people April 21st, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. Well, today is Palm Sunday and uh, we are going to continue in our series Encounters with Jesus. So this will not be a traditional Palm Sunday message. We're actually going to look at a, an encounter uh, that Jesus had on the cross today. Um, but if you're just jumping in with us, we have been walking through this series, Encounters with Jesus, where we're looking at people's real encounters with the real Jesus. It's a bunch of different people that we've looked at who have had a real encounter with the real Jesus, and we've looked at the impact that encounter has had on their life, and for many of them, changed their, their life forever, for all of eternity. And so that's what we're going to do today. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to Luke chapter 23. Uh, while you're turning there, just want to remind you, last week we looked at the encounter between Pilate and Jesus, and we left off where Pilate had handed Jesus over to be crucified. Uh, so today we're going to be picking it up at the crucifixion of Jesus. And um, if you have your Bibles with you, Luke 23, uh, I want to invite you, uh, this is a short passage, so I'm going to read the entire thing here. If you would stand for the reading of the word along with me, if you are able to, to stand for the reading of the word. Luke chapter 23, 
starting at verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he, has, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for what we are, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active. We thank you that you are still teaching us by the power of your Holy Spirit. You are illuminating your word to us. And and I pray that as we study your word today, that you would ultimately lead us to the living word that is Jesus, your son, that we would have an encounter with him. As we study this encounter today, that we would personally encounter Jesus for ourselves. So I pray that you would speak through me, speak to all of us. And I pray most importantly, Heavenly Father, that that your words would be the words that we hold on to. That that when we leave this place, it would not be my words, but yours that we're we're remembering and that we're, we're holding on to and that we're living out as we go from here. So have your way. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. So today's encounter is between Jesus and two criminals. We're going to focus in on one of those criminals, but this was two criminals who were crucified with him. Uh, We don't have much information about these two men. Uh, They are mentioned in all four Gospels, but only here at the crucifixion. So we don't get the backstory on them. We don't get their names. We don't get any other detail about them other than uh, when they are on the cross with Jesus. Um, Now, Luke refers to them as criminals, but in Matthew and Mark, we get a little more detail. So Luke's Luke's using a broad word to describe them. Matthew and Mark give a little more specificity. Uh, They use this Greek word, leistes, which translates to rebels or robbers or bandits or thieves. So you've often heard these two uh, referred to as thieves on the cross or the thief on the cross. And and that's why. Um, And and some uh, uh, scholars even believe that this term would have applied to insurrectionists. So people who weren't just um, trying to rob the ordinary person out on the street, they were actually a part of an organized crime unit possibly that was trying to rob and steal and overthrow the Roman Empire. And if you remember last week, we touched on this, but Barabbas was also also, uh, referenced as a thief and as a murderer and as an insurrectionist. And so there is a really good chance that these two men were supposed to be crucified right along with Barabbas, that maybe all three of them were even even working together and they all got caught and then they were all going to be crucified until the crowd said that they wanted to free Barabbas and they wanted to crucify Jesus. And so that's why Jesus is now uh, being crucified right along with them. I want to work through this passage slowly, starting at verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals One on his right, the other on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. So I'm going to pause there. Uh, I want us to get to this encounter between Jesus and the two criminals, and specifically between Jesus and and one criminal in particular. But but we can't move past this too quickly. Uh, I just want to remind you what we're reading here. This is the setting for our story. This actually happened in real human history, that this is Jesus, the sinless son of God, who is being crucified, being executed in one one of the most painful and horrible ways that anybody could ever be killed. And he's being crucified right alongside two other criminals. 
Now, last week, uh, I closed our service by reading from the prophet Isaiah, which was written 700 years before Jesus walked the earth. And in in Isaiah 53, verse 12, uh, Isaiah writes about the coming Messiah. Uh, He says, he poured out his life unto death and he was numbered with the transgressors. So Isaiah was prophesying right then about the fact that when Jesus would be killed, when the Messiah would be killed, that he he would be killed along with others. And so we get this unbelievable detail in this prophecy coming true here. Here is Jesus hanging on a cross and dying for those who are crucifying him, dying for them, for their sins, for the sins of those who are crucifying him. And he's being crucified with two other criminals. And don't miss this detail. While that's happening, Jesus prays, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. So so the one who never sinned, let alone never committed a crime, is now hanging on a cross, experiencing the most pain that anybody could ever imagine, And while people are are hurling insults at him, while they're they're mocking him, while they're crucifying him, Jesus is praying for those people. And he's saying, Father, forgive them. That's his prayer for them. Forgive them. They don't understand what they're doing right now. And and I just want to remind you that Jesus actually taught this in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5. So Jesus doesn't just teach us. He practices What he preaches. I I just just want you to catch this. In Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 45, the Sermon on the Mount, he says, You have heard it is said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So Jesus is teaching his disciples early on in his public ministry and teaching the multitudes early on in his public ministry that this is how you're to respond. When someone persecutes you, you are to love your enemies, not hate them. And actually, when they're persecuting you, you should pray for them. He teaches that and then he models it. He demonstrates the heart of God. He doesn't just tell us to do this. He shows us how this is done. And so I'm just giving you that maybe as a little bit of a teaser because later on this year... We are going to spend 20 weeks in the Sermon on the Mount, Uh, really from from about August all the way through December. We're going to spend 20 weeks in three chapters of the Bible, the Sermon on the Mount. That's Jesus' most uh, well-known teaching that he ever delivered, most well-known sermon that he ever gave. And and we're going to spend 20 weeks because uh, I I just feel like I want to have the longest sermon series I can possibly have. That's ultimately the goal. This one right now is getting close, uh, but that one will will trump even the one we're in right now. So, So Jesus models the this behavior, he prays for them, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. That's the heart of God, that while he's on the cross, dying for the ones who are crucifying him, he's praying to his heavenly Father, and ultimately, the answer is, yes, your, your heavenly Father will forgive them, and you and me, because of what Jesus is doing. The only way for the Father to forgive us is for Jesus to go to the cross and pay the price for your sins and mine. And it's, so it's through Jesus' sacrifice that the Father will forgive them. And then one more detail before we move on. It says they di- divided up his clothes by casting lots. So uh, maybe a modern-day equivalent of that would be by flipping a coin. But, but we get that detail, and you might wonder, like, well, why, why would we have that note there? Like, why would that be included that they divided up his clothes by casting lots? Well, in John's gospel, he tells us that this happened so that scripture would actually be fulfilled, another prophecy about the Messiah. And, and this scripture is actually from the book of Psalms. It's a Psalm of David, and this one was written, listen to this, 1,000 plus years before Jesus walked the earth. And in Psalm 22, verse 18, it says, they divided my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. It's that level of detail that was prophesied about the coming Messiah. And I also just want to encourage you, this is the same Psalm that Jesus quotes from on the cross when he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's Psalm 22. That's the beginning of Psalm 22. So if you've ever wondered, what is Jesus saying and what is he doing there? I want to encourage you this week, this is a great homework assignment for you. As you prepare for Easter this week, go and read through the entire Psalm, Psalm 22, and and then move over to Psalm 23 after that. Read through Psalm 22 and Psalm 23. It is so, so powerful. You, You will gain a whole new understanding of what Jesus is saying and what he is doing when he quotes that Psalm. So let's, let's go back to the text. I want to pick it up at verse 35. 
It says, the people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, he saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah, the chosen one. See, they, they still didn't get it. They, they thought the Messiah would come to save himself. No, he came to give his life so that he could save everyone else. And then the soldiers, verse 36, also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of, Jews, of, of the Jews, save yourself. And there was even a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. And so everyone there, the crowd, the religious leaders, the rulers, the soldiers, everyone present is mocking Jesus and hurling insults at Jesus as he's hanging on the cross, dying for their sins and, and mine and yours. And, and I just want to remind us again, it's so easy for us when we read the Bible to insert ourselves in the story, in the position of the innocent bystander or, or even of the hero. But the reality is, most likely, if you were there and I were there, we would be doing the exact same thing that they were doing. We are all guilty. Every single one of us. But I want, I want you to catch this. Everyone is mocking Jesus. And, and we're going to get this detail here. Even the two criminals mock Jesus. Now in Luke's gospel, he doesn't give us that specific detail, but this is why when you read the Bible, especially when you read about the crucifixion and the resurrection, I would highly encourage you to read all four gospel accounts, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, because it kind of gives us a, a, a better understanding of the whole picture. But in Matthew and Mark, they tell us, both of those gospels tell us that these two criminals were also hurling insults at Jesus. So this is in Matthew chapter 27. You can turn there with me quickly if you want. Uh, picking it up at verse 38. It says, two rebels were crucified with him, one on his right, one on his left. That's the exact same detail. Those who passed by hurled insults at him, shaking their heads and saying, you who are going to destroy the temple and build it in three days, save yourself. Come down from the cross if you are the son of God. In the same way, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders mocked him. The religious people, the, the religious leaders, the ones who were supposed to know God the best, despised Jesus the most. Verse 42, he saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. He is the king of Israel. Let him come down now from the cross and we will believe in him. He trusts in God. Let God rescue him now if he wants uh, if he wants him, for he said, I am the son of God. I want to remind you again, Jesus was crucified. He was ultimately sent to the cross because he clearly claimed that he was the sinless son of God. Verse 44, in the same way, listen to this detail. In the same way, the rebels who were crucified with him also heaped insults on him. Not just one, but both. Both of the rebels. Mark's gospel says the same thing. Verse 32, the end of Mark uh, 15, 32 says, those crucified with him also heaped insults on him. And so earlier on in the crucifixion, everyone, including both rebels, both criminals, both thieves, are mocking Jesus and hurling insults at him. And that detail matters. It's really important, especially as we approach our encounter here today. That both of them, we're hurling insults at Jesus because this makes it overwhelmingly clear that neither of these criminals prior to the crucifixion were followers of Jesus. Neither of them had ever trusted Jesus in any way for, for, for their salvation or even just looked at him with any sort of sympathy. Neither one of them probably knew anything about Jesus. And here they are, they're both hurling insults at him. So, so there's no possibility that maybe one of them was, was a, a follower of Jesus or at least curious about Jesus or, or maybe had believed in Jesus previously and then just kind of got caught up in, in a, making some bad decisions and ultimately got crucified and then put his faith in Jesus. It's not possible. Neither one of them. They were, they were both hurling insults at him, both mocking him. And, and then that, that leads us to our, our, our encounter here. Verse 39 Luke 23, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him, aren't you the Messiah, save yourself and us? But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for, what, for we are getting what our deeds deserve, 
but this man has done nothing wrong. So maybe you're asking the question, well, what's going on here? Like, did they hurl insults at him or, or not? Did one or both? And I, I just want to remind you that we're getting a snapshot of, a, of, of an encounter that actually lasted for six hours. Mark's gospel tells us that, that Jesus was crucified at uh, nine in the morning and that he died at three in the afternoon. There was a six hour time span that these brothers were on the cross next to Jesus on either side of him. And early on in the crucifixion, both of them along with everybody else were hurling insults and mocking Jesus. But somewhere along the way, something happened where one of these men started to understand that there's something different about Jesus. And I've often wondered what happened. Like what changed his mind? What happened to lead him to, to a different conclusion? Because at the beginning of the day here, when, when they're first hanging on the cross, they're both mocking Jesus. And now near the end of the crucifixion, one of them is still doing so. And the other one now shifts his tone and he's actually defending Jesus. What happened to make him make that shift? And I, and I wonder like what kind of conversation might they have had? Have you ever thought about that? Like, like we don't have every detail again of what took place. But I, I just wonder, like, what, what kind of conversation might they have had on the cross? Like, what, what could Jesus have said to this man that maybe would have changed his heart, changed his tone, changed his attitude? What, what kind of conversation might they have had? Or, or maybe it was just him watching what Jesus was doing. Like, maybe they were mocking Jesus and hurling insults early on. And then he heard Jesus utter these words, Father, would you forgive them for they don't know what they're doing? And he goes, wait a second, that, that, that's not normal, ordinary human behavior. No regular person prays for people who are crucifying them. There's something unique about this man. There's something different about him. There's something that sets him apart. And, and and I don't know what it is, but I've got to shift the way I'm thinking here because I've been hurling insults at him and maybe I need to worship him. Like, like we don't know what happened. We don't have the details. Sometimes I wonder if maybe it was just was it the Holy Spirit illuminating his, his heart and his mind so that he could see Jesus with spiritual eyes and understand who he really was. We don't know. And maybe it was simply just being in the presence of Jesus for six hours on a cross. I'm not sure what it was, but something about encountering Jesus Jesus changed this man's perspective. And maybe, maybe it was just the fact that he's now staring down death. And reality is starting to set in that he's about to meet his maker. And I tell you what, things change when you're staring down death and you recognize you're going to meet your maker. And you start to see clearly in that moment. And I just wonder if that's what happened for this man. He started to see clearly. You see, one of them, again, is, is continuing to hurl insults. Aren't, aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But he's not saying that in, in a statement of faith. He's saying if you were the Messiah, you, you wouldn't be on this cross right now. And, and you would free yourself from this cross and you would free us. Surely you're not the Messiah. But the other one comes to his defense. Watch this. He says, don't you fear God? Man, what a question. And that's a question every single one of us have to wrestle with at some point in our lives. Don't you fear God? Do you? Do you fear God? Don't you fear God? Since you are under the same sentence. Meaning like, bro, death is near for you. Death is near for me. And, and, and I'm, I'm starting to believe that maybe there's more to life than this life. Don't you fear God? We are under the same sentence. And then watch this. He says, we are punished justly for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. And, and so he acknowledges there is a God. He acknowledges that he's guilty and he's a sinner. He doesn't use those words. I want you to catch that. Not using a whole lot of churchy language here, but he's acknowledging that he's guilty and then he's acknowledging that Jesus is innocent. So he's, he's, in a way, kind of preaching the gospel here. Like, he, he doesn't get it yet. But he's saying, don't, don't you fear God? Like, there is a God. I, I'm getting what I deserve. I'm guilty. I'm a sinner. And this man who's, who's dying in between us, he's, he's getting what he doesn't deserve. He's innocent. 
He, he shouldn't be dying on this cross. This man has done nothing wrong. And then that leads us to their encounter with each other. Verse 42. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. So this is how the encounter ends. Like these are the last words that were exchanged between Jesus and this thief on the cross. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. That's it. Like that's his salvation prayer. Did you catch that? He doesn't even ask Jesus to save him. He doesn't even feel worthy. He doesn't say, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, make sure that I have a seat at the table. He, he, he humbles himself so low to just say, would you just remember me? Like, Jesus, would you just, I, I believe that you are who you say you are. I believe that you are, there's something special about you. You have a kingdom that's not of this world. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus looks back at him and he says, that's enough. That's enough. That's all I need. That's enough. And so today you will be with me in paradise. I don't know if you've caught it, but all throughout these encounters with Jesus, there is this pattern where Jesus simply says, all I want is all you have. And for this thief on the cross, he goes, this is all I have. This is all I have. He doesn't pray some sort of uh, uh, sinner's prayer. He, he doesn't even acknowledge that he's a sinner. He just, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. He put his faith in Jesus and said, would you remember me? And Jesus' response is, truly, I tell you. That, that, that language there is important. Like, pay attention. Don't miss this. Truly, I tell you. This is a promise. You can take this to the bank. You can count on this. Truly, I tell you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You have been granted salvation. You have been granted eternal life. Today you will be with me in paradise. Now, I, I know this isn't the primary focus of this passage, but I, I just want to make sure that I, I speak to this briefly here. When I read this text, this is one of many reasons why I am convinced that when we die, when we cease to exist in this life, when we leave this earth, we are immediately in the presence of God. We are immediately in the presence of our Heavenly Father. We are immediately in the presence of Jesus. This is a promise from Jesus. So I, I just, just want to reassure you, and for those of you who maybe you've, you've lost loved ones, and you're wondering, like, well, wait a second, how does all this work? I, I'm just telling you, stand firm on the truth of the word of God. That's a promise from Jesus. You put your faith in him, then, then when you leave this earth, you are with him. That's how this works. You are with him for all of eternity. But this is, this is the, the encounter. This is how it ends. Him simply saying, Jesus, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? And Jesus says, yes. Because all I want is all you have. And, and what you have is, is good enough for me. And so, so today, you will be with me in paradise. You know, there's this well-known Bible teacher, pastor, preacher. His name is Alistair Begg. And He's Scottish, and he's got this great Scottish accent. He preaches at a church over in Cleveland, Ohio, but he's never lost the accent. He's um, getting up there in, in age, but man, an unbelievable gifted communicator, teacher, and preacher. And he has this powerful illustration about this, this text. And I, I'm going to share it with you, but I'm not going to do the Scottish accent. <laughs> I'm not very good at that. But when he was teaching on this, he said... Um, he started by asking the question, if you were to die tonight, you were trying to gain entry into heaven. And they said, you know, on what basis should you be allowed in? What would your answer be? And he said, if, if at any point your answer is led with the first person, because I, because I had faith, because I believed, because I served, because I gave, 
because I sacrificed, then you have completely missed the mark. He said the only right answer is in the third person, because he because he, because Jesus paid the price for my sins, because Jesus paid it all on the cross. The only reason why any of us gain entry into eternal life, the only reason why any of us receive this free gift of salvation is because of Jesus and not because of us. And and, and then he says, he goes on to say, well, think about the thief on the cross. There's probably no greater example than the thief on the cross. He said, I can't wait till I get to heaven one day and and I get to meet that guy. I want to just go up to him and ask him, you know, like, how did that work out for you? You know, because at one minute you're, you're, you're cussing the guy out on the cross and and then less than six hours later, you're simply saying, remember me. and, And somehow you made it. Like, how did you do that? How did you make it? He goes, and that's, that's must be what the angel said when he got up to heaven. You know, the angel goes, well, how did you get here? And the guy goes, well, I don't know. He goes, what do you mean you don't know? I, 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 don't, I don't know. I, I'm still trying to figure that out. Well, no, you got to have an answer. How did, you, how did you get her? What did you do? How did you make? I, I, don't, I don't know. He goes, okay, I got to go get my supervisor angel. So he goes and gets the supervisor angel. The angel comes over and he goes, hey, right, well, let, let, let's ask some questions. Then are you clear on the, the, the doctrine of justification by faith? And the guy goes, I've never heard of that. He'll go, okay, how about, uh, how, much, how much scripture do you have memorized? What's that? Okay, how many times did you go to church in your life? Well, never. We're not even sure what that is. How much money did you give to the kingdom of God? Well, none. Actually, I stole. I took a lot. I I probably still owe a lot of people. I haven't paid that back. Okay, well, what, what good deed did you do in the name of the Lord our God? Nothing. I was dying on a cross. I could do nothing for him. I had nothing to offer him. I had nothing to give. So then explain to me, how did you get here? And he finally says, I don't know what else to tell you other than this. The man on the middle cross said that I could come. And that's the answer. That's the gospel. That's the good news of the gospel is that the man on the middle cross said that you and I can come. And so I want you to hear me. I I, I want to turn this inward now. This isn't just us studying somebody else's encounter. I want you to put yourself in the shoes of these men here because at the end of the day, we only have one of two choices. Every single one of us here are criminals. Every single one of us deserve to be on Jesus's right and Jesus's left. And so the question is, which criminal are you? There are no innocent bystanders in the kingdom of God. We're all guilty criminals that Jesus paid the price for our sins. The question is, are you the criminal who's gonna reject him or are you the criminal that's gonna receive him? That's your only choice. My hope and my prayer for every single one of us is that we recognize that we are guilty, but that he paid the price. And so we can receive his free gift of salvation for each and every one of us. And so let me me close by saying this, and then I want to read a passage of scripture over us. I've said it a lot in this series. But if, if your faith somehow makes it so that, that you're, you're too uncomfortable to associate with sinners, then, then you're probably too religious for Jesus. Because the place we find Jesus is hanging on a cross in between two guilty sinners. That, that's, that's where he is. And, and so I, I just want to remind, like, this, this is what Easter is all about. This is why we invite people. This is why we're doing three services. This is why we get uncomfortable. This is, this is why we invest money into a new facility so that we can make more room. Because at the end of the day, there is only one hope and his name is Jesus. It's not you and it's not me, but it's Jesus. And so I, I want to close by, by reading this passage of scripture over you. And if you would, um, please, one last time, stand with me as I read the, the word of God over each and every one of us. So this comes from Ephesians chapter 2. Starting at verse 1, this is what is true about each and every one of us. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us 
all of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath. But listen to this. But because of his great love for us, not us, but him, because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms, in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. Listen to these words. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith and it is and this is not from yourselves it is the gift of god not by works so that no one can boast for we are god's handiwork created in christ jesus to do good works which god prepared in advance for us to do pray with me heavenly father again we thank you we thank you for your word we thank you for the truth of your word we thank you for the hope of the gospel and Father, right now, I just want to pray for any person who's sitting in this room or tuning in online who feels unworthy of, of your grace. I pray that, that this encounter today would reveal to all of us that there is no one too far gone for you to save. There was a man hanging on a cross guilty of his crimes and unable to do one good deed in order to earn his salvation. And yet, because he simply prayed and put his faith in you. You get granted him eternal life with you that day. God, I pray for anyone who is here today who is in that place that they would not leave here without surrendering their life to you and receiving their free gift of salvation from you for all of eternity. I got, God, I pray also that for the rest of us who are in Christ, that we would never lose sight of the gospel. That, that we would never drift into trying to earn our salvation or, or base our salvation off of anything that we have done because you have paid it all. And so, Jesus, I pray that you would just be with us as we go from this place. Minister to us through your Holy Spirit and have your way. We love you and we pray this all in your mighty name. And everybody said, amen. 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 Let's celebrate King Jesus together. Our prayer team will be available for you after service. God bless you guys. You're dismissed.